Hey, a hearty welcome to you. Jonathan Faust here. I will be leading the following meditation and then introducing an archive talk. Good to have you here. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Before we begin, um, let's jump in. Uh, I've got some thank yous, some acknowledgements. We'll have the meditation, then I'm going to introduce the talk and the whole series that we're going to be exploring for the next little while. Big, big thank you to our producer, to Glenn Harrison. Thank you, Glenn, for making all this happen for all of us. To the Insight Meditation Community of Washington for hosting this event and for all, all they do. A big, big, big thank you to our Mindful Movement Leader, to Rita Moran, and our Mindful Dialogue Leader, Ray Manioki. If you'd like the full Monday night smorgasbord experience, you can sign on. 6.30 Eastern Standard with Rita, who will expertly guide you through mindful movement, massage you into a sense of presence for this meditation and talk. And then afterward, in the spirit of integration, connection, finding like-minded people, you can join with Ray Manioki, who leads Mindful Dialogue, which is a conversation and uh, connection around practice. Those links are on my website and on my Facebook page. There are Zoom sessions with Rita and with Ray. And um, please feel free to join in. Also, just to say that this is all offered freely so that no one is denied access to these practices and to these teachings. It's a uh, offering of, of joy and uh, with extreme pleasure and um, satisfaction. And you can support this by making an offering. No attachment to the results. <laughs> As I like to say, it's a really neurotic way to make a living, but it's a satisfying way just to make sure no one's denied access to these practices and teachings. I do have a newsletter, a weekly and a monthly. Um, gives you an update on what's coming up and a review monthly of the talks and my photography for the month. And next big thing, a, uh, January 21st, a day long, the most important thing, starting your year with mindful intention. Uh, feel free to join in. Uh, be great to have you there. Okay, uh, without further ado, let's start with a short meditation and then I'm gonna give a little introduction to the talk and then to this series. You might like to let your body move and stretch in any way that feels good. Get the wiggles out. This upcoming talk is on establishing mindfulness. So we'll kind of go through the steps of what that means. <clears throat> you might like to close your eyes. As you settle in, let your eyes settle and begin to bring your awareness inside. Where do you feel the breath right now? Where do you feel it the most predominant? And just for a few rounds of breath, just track the experience of the breath right here. The breath moving in. Breath moving out. Notice now the sounds around you. 360 degrees. Bring your awareness to where the skin is touching the air. And notice the, the texture of the air, the temperature a contact point. And you'll notice that the breath, the sounds, the point of contact with the air touching your skin are all rooted in the here and now. They're rooted in the senses. And as you focus your attention here, you'll also be aware of that which is paying attention, this quality of attention itself. Mindfulness can be viewed as this quality of non-judging awareness. Just simply awake to what's here without 
commentary without needing it to be any different. One of the ways you can deepen the sense of here and now is through conscious softening and relaxing. Sensing now from the inside what it feels like to relax and soften all the muscles of your face. Allow all expression to melt away and track this inner sense of softening and letting go. You might bring your attention to the inside of your mouth. Sense now if you could relax your tongue. Could you feel the whole tongue relaxing and filling your lower jaw? Is it possible to unhinge your jaw, to relax your jaw and sense if you could relax the root of your tongue down into your throat and track again this felt shift inside. You might feel your arms heavy and sensing from the inside from the shoulder joints down through your elbows. And as if you could sense from the center of the bones, from the elbows down through the wrists. And could you now soften your palms Relax the fingers and thumbs and sense from the inside out. And can you sense here the pulse or tingling or vibration? Sensing from the inside, the lower back and the buttocks. What could soften here? What could relax? The belly and the lower abdomen. Down through the floor of the pelvis. tracking this felt sense of softening. Sensing now from the hip joints down through the knees. The knees down through the ankles. the tops of the feet and the toes. And as if you could sense from the inside, the soles of the feet and the heels. Sensing the whole body from the inside now is there anything that could relax or soften or let go? And you might now bring your attention very lightly to an anchor, to a focal point. You might elect to focus on the breath, the belly or the nostrils, or a sense of the whole body breathing.
Or you might like to explore the sound vibrations, the real-time experience of sounds right now. Letting your attention now settle on the breath or sound, or if there's another anchor that works for you, let this be your primary point of attention. The mind, of course, will continue to generate thoughts, but when you wake up in the middle of a thought bubble, how gently can you bring your attention back to the here and now? Relaxed and alert. Is it possible to cultivate a sense of non-judging awareness? The mind naturally generates stories and predicts things and comments on what's happening. The moment you notice that, can you smile inwardly? Escort your attention back to the breath or sounds or your anchor re-arrive, re-relax, and explore the sense of here and now. In the next minute or so, you might explore what it's like to relax even more. Again, the face expressionless, the tongue relaxed. Perhaps deepening the sense of what it's like to be relaxed on the inside. And at the same time, with this quality of alertness. Letting all technique fall away now. Just relax and feel. Feel the imprint of these minutes of guiding your attention in, deeply softening and arriving. Feel free to let your body move and stretch in any way that feels good. When you're ready, you can open your eyes or remain with them closed. Welcome back. It's a new year, and it's a nice time to reflect on some of the core of the teachings that we're engaging into here. I am working on a project that um, I've been meaning to for a good while. I'm hoping to create a kind of a a companion program for people working with chronic pain. So I'm going to be focusing on that for this next little while. And I thought I might offer up a series of talks, which I gave a little while ago, on the seven factors of awakening. These are so critical to practice. And 
listening to them again, if you heard them before, um, isn't going to hurt you. I always like to joke that um, it's all the same talk, uh, essentially. And I always like to quote Gil Fronstahl, who said, you know, when you listen to a Dharma talk, imagine it's like a shower. You're just letting it kind of pour over you and see what see what seeps in, see what just goes down the drain. This first talk is on establishing mindfulness. It's one of the keys, the absolute keys to freedom. I hope you enjoy the following talk. So many blessings. Take good care. It is great to have this time with you. Thank you. I lost my dad a number of years ago. Um, he had dementia and Alzheimer's, but preceding that, he was a really brilliant guy, one of the funniest, most clever people I, 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 I've known. He was a professor of English, and he always had these little sayings that would little little koans that would kind of turn my head and one time um as i was kind of finishing up my my degree i told him that i i thought i would go ahead and get my masters in, in teaching and because i thought maybe teaching was part of my destiny and he listened and he said hmm teaching so it's it's pretty tough he said i mean how do you teach someone to take a hint? How do you teach someone to take a hint? How do you teach someone to be more aware? Is it possible to be more aware? When we talk about being more aware or being more mindful in the context of meditation, we're talking about being awake to reality, about being awake to what is true, to what was true Thousands of years ago, what will be true in the future, the sense of perennial truth. And that's what I'd like to talk about today and in the next couple of talks. There's one of the lists, as you know, this practice is filled with lists. But one of the lists is the seven factors of awakening. I'm not going to go into all seven. I won't even list them because I'm not sure that's really helpful. But what I'd like to do is to, to take my time and to look at them closely. Uh, each of them stands alone, but together, when these seven factors come together, it gives you a real potency to to look closer at the nature of reality. You know, the analogy is that when you engage into practice with the intention to wake up, you're swimming upstream against the culture, against your own conditioning. And it takes a certain amount of firepower, certain factors <clears throat> to help you do this. And I offer this at a time when so many of us are under a great amount of stress. Uh, the suffering in our culture right now is it, it's almost unbearable. And there's more I could say about that. But I truly, truly offer these practices as not only practices that can help you to calm and soothe and connect with center. But these are also practices of awakening. These are practices of profound transformation. It's about waking up to reality. And the first of these steps is about establishing mindfulness, not just in your practice, but in your life. I'd like to talk about this, this concept of riding the wave. When, when something really challenging comes up, how do you bring mindfulness into the moments when you're extremely challenged like we are now? And I'd like to talk about some very practical strategies for cultivating mindfulness in your life. I have the privilege of being part of long retreats, seven day retreats, of being one of the teachers, which is offering talks, leading meditations, but also working with people as they're trying on these practices and letting the, the virus of mindfulness do what it needs to do internally. So we have private meetings and we have meetings in small groups throughout the course of, of the week. And I'd like to kind of track in this talk, the little time I have here, of what it was like working with someone who was just doing fine and then suddenly 
kind of overcome with anxiety and worry in her practice. She was worried, are her parents going to be okay? Do I have enough money for retirement? Is my relationship really solid? Just the that firestorm of, of doubt, anxiety, fear. And she was basically asking me, how do I get out of this? How do I get free from worry? She said, I feel like I'm eternally spinning. I'm, I'm getting reactivated. I'm digging deeper and deeper holes for myself. Maybe you know that feeling when you just feel stuck. It's like being on a hamster wheel of just circular thinking, the same thoughts cycling through again and again and again with no resolution and no insight. And this is really what mindfulness practice is all about. It's about, about getting free. It's about cultivating a sense of happiness. It's about learning how to open into these immeasurable states of, of heart and mind that is awake to reality. You ever have random happy attacks? When, when you feel happy for absolutely no reason whatsoever? I hope you do. I really hope you do. And when I get those random happy attacks, there's this sense that this is home. Like this is, this is where I'm supposed to be. In a sense of like, it's so easy. It's so simple. It's just being in the grace of presence. And then, and then I'm stuck again. I'm again, I'm caught in some wheel. I remember once going to one of the wellness fairs many, many years ago, and the Hare Krishnas had this booth, and they they had this little um, little sculpture, which they have in all their booths, where they show kind of the wheel of samsara, you know, where they show, like, rising out of the muck, uh, a, little, a little baby, and then the baby learns to walk, and the baby learns to stand, and the next one is the baby is, you know, running, and then the baby's aging and then the baby's dying and going into the muck and then arising. And it's just set up as this wheel. This is the wheel of becoming just the wheel of, of insatiable desire where we, we rise, we're filled with passion. We're filled with regret. We die. We're born again. That's that model. And who knows whether all that is so, whether there's any reincarnation, whatever that is, but there's something about this wheel of desire and suffering that we're all caught in to different degrees. And how do we, how do we get off the wheel? How do we, how do we free ourselves from being identification from identified from holding on? So this, exploration of these factors of awakening has been very, very helpful for me. And I, I feel pretty confident it'll be helpful for you too. I'll go more into how they all work together, but I'd like to take some time to focus on the fundamentals here, like establishing mindfulness. <clears throat> so have you ever seen the movie, uh, the Disney movie inside out? If you haven't, highly, highly recommend it. It's the story of Riley, who's a happy, hockey-loving 11-year-old girl from the Midwest who moves to San Francisco with her family. There's a lot of stress in this move for Riley, and she's got a lot of, a lot of emotions that start to come to the surface in her 11-year-old brain. And the movie's all about the representation of these emotions. And it's incredibly clever, incredibly sweet, incredibly sad, incredibly profound. And one of these emotions is joy. And really joyful little kid, but, but the stress leads to sadness. And when she's swept away by all these strong emotions in, in headquarters, all that's left are anger and fear and disgust. And we get to watch these different voices having their turn at the microphone. We see joy running around trying to fix everything. We see sadness wanting to kind of slow everything down. We see anger and disgust arising at different times. And it's fascinating because you get to watch Riley's dialogue between these different voices. And we, we get to explore really how she overcomes trauma. 
And what I love about the movie is how um, it provides such a mirror for the filters that we're all looking through. These filters of emotions. And there are many, many different filters. There are many little parts here. We have the we have the spiritual warrior, we have the controller, we have the young child, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And one of the things I found in reading about the movie that that one of the one of the parts or one of the voices that the writer really fought for was uh, Schadenfreude, which is the taking pleasure at other people's suffering. Uh, he lost that that lost that debate, but you can imagine the. Uh, the visuals that that could have created. So it's a great movie. It's a perfect example of what happens when we're not aware that you're just looking through a filter. You're looking at life through the filter of joy, through sadness or through anger. And when you're not aware of the filter, you're identified with the filter. You believe it. You believe the thoughts. You believe the emotions. You're, you're identified and to some degree you're trapped. And mindfulness is the awareness of the filter. When you become aware of the filter, it's, it's really, it's kind of a miracle. So it's the difference between being lost in thought and waking up out of thought. A thousand times a day, this happens. You're focused on something, you get distracted, and you come back. You're working on your email, something comes up, you come back to your email. So in meditation, we get to slow everything down, and you get to see how that occurs. You get to really kind of break it down. You get to explore the difference between being lost in thought and being awake. And that's what mindfulness is. You could say ignorance is when you're lost in thought or you're identified with the filters. And wisdom is when you're awake. This is such a fundamental teaching. And it's so amazing that 2,600 years ago, when this was offered in another part of the planet, it has so much relevance right now. It's so essential. And it's, it's feeding so many of us in a very, very powerful way. So, so what is mindfulness? You could say it's living in the moment. But I have to acknowledge Joseph Goldstein, who's written beautifully on this, and his talks are beautiful on mindfulness. He talks a lot about black lab consciousness. If you see a black lab, it's, it's very, very present but not, not necessarily awake. It's very, very much in the filter of sniffing, sniffing, <laughs> jumping, jumping, peeing, peeing, eating, eating. And this reminded me of a cartoon I saw in the, uh, uh, the New Yorker. It was four panels. And in one panel, there was this golden retriever. And the caption was, happy golden retriever. The next one was sad golden retriever. The next one was angry golden retriever. Next one is depressed golden retriever. So it's a difference between living in the moment and being awake in the moment. There, there's something missing when we don't have that sense of wakefulness. So there's something here about mindfulness as being recognizing what is present. I love the expression non-judging awareness. It's like when you're aware in the absence of judgment, new possibilities arise. It has a quality of non-grasping, a quality of not pushing away. And, and maybe one of the most succinct or surgical descriptions of mindfulness is that it, it's, it's awareness without filters. And the primary filters that that cover color everything are greed, wanting, aversion, hatred, ill will, judgment, and delusion. So it's awareness without the filter of greed, hatred, or delusion, or confusion. What we really want in our heart of hearts, I think, is to be awake to be awake to reality, to know what, to know what is true. 
And just like when you practice concentration meditation, where your focus is on being present, you'll notice how you're not present. If you focus on the heart practices and you want to cultivate kindness, it automatically means you're going to notice everything that is not kind. And when you try to get a sense of what's real, you're going to see all the little permutations of what is not real. That's what the practice is all about. It's the challenge and the joy of waking up. It's when it comes to mindfulness, it's knowing that you are knowing. I love that definition. Some people sat around, came up with this definition that we are, we are not homo sapiens. We are homo sapiens sapiens, that we can know that we are knowing. And this is the observing power of the mind to know that you are knowing. It's amazing. So as many times as you are lost in a day, you can wake up. And it's kind of embarrassing, isn't it? How many times you get swept away into the dream world of the mind. And of course, you see this in your meditation practice. And you see this when you're practicing intensively, like on a, on a retreat. When you're on a retreat, your only job is to notice what's happening. And then you begin to notice just how out of control the mind is. But there's something very soothing about this poem I'd like to read from my, my dear friend, Dana Falls. It's called Walk Slowly. She writes this. It only takes a reminder to breathe, a moment to be still. And just like that, something in me settles and softens and make space for imperfection. The harsh voice of a judgment drops to a whisper, and I remember again that life isn't a relay race, that we will all cross the finish line, that waking up to life is what we were born for. As many times as I forget and catch myself charging forward without even knowing where I'm going, that many times... I can make the choice to stop, to breathe and be, and walk slowly into the mystery. One of my teachers said, in meditation or in life, when you notice that you are lost in the dream world of thinking or the narrative, you have two options. One is to chastise and beat yourself up for forgetting. The second is to celebrate that you woke up. The latter is a lot more fun, a mild celebration. And in a meditation practice, one beautiful instruction I've heard is that when you notice the mind has wandered, to smile. Let that be an expression of wakefulness. It's so simple. It's just not easy. There's a story of one of the benefactors of the Buddha. One of the donors was, was with the Buddha and they're looking down on, on their little community. And this donor said, how is it that everyone who follows your practices seems so radiant and so happy? And the Buddha said, well, we're aware when we're sitting we're aware when we're walking. We're aware when we're doing chores. And the benefactor said, but, but everyone sits and everyone walks and everyone does their chores. And the Buddha said, yes, but, but how many of us are aware when we're sitting and we're walking and we're doing chores? This is the observing power of observation. When you're not lost in your story, you're present. You know that you're knowing. And it can open up such a powerful inquiry. What does it mean to be alive? What, what is a thought? And this is something that can be so, so potent and something that Joseph Goldstein, who speaks so beautifully on mindfulness, talks about is just reflecting, what is a thought? There's content in a thought and there's, there's value in the thought. Our whole life is run by thoughts. Do this, do that. 
But what happens when you're stuck in those thoughts, when you, you can't turn the thoughts off? And of course, what happens when you believe all your thoughts? One of the most powerful things that happens to me every time I do a long-term retreat, I have this head smack. And I realize I don't have to believe every thought. When we become the one who's aware of the thinking process, freedom begins to open up inside. So back to my interaction with this woman who was caught in anxiety and worry. And we explored the attitudes she had about this whole process. And she thought, well, here I am realizing I'm not a very good meditator. I should be able to figure this issue out so I can move on to this retreat and move on to my life. This shouldn't be happening on a retreat when I'm supposed to be peaceful. I came here for insight to get a sense of what's possible, what's next in my life. And here I am. I got to get out of this. Of course, this is the classic dilemma. When you are filled with unpleasantness, you naturally want to nuke it and move on to something else. But remembering these primary fundamental teachings in our practice, these four cornerstones of our practice that, that stress and suffering are part of the human experience. They're, they happen, they're unavoidable. That the source of your stress has something to do with clinging, identification, with attachment. The third, that it's possible to let go of that clinging and that attachment. And there, there's a path of practices and observations and guidelines that, that help you to let go more and more and more. And so, so we look toward what's not flowing. We actually turn to look at what is stuck. If you're familiar with the acronym of RAIN, you, you recognize what's here. Just naming it can be helpful. You ask if you can allow it, if you can make room for it. Sometimes you can't. But then you can look closer now to the eye of rain to investigate, really investigate what's here. And so we looked at this filter, this attitude in the mind. There's a beautiful simile from the Buddha. It kind of describes it. It's all right here. He said, there is no fire like lust. There is no grip like anger. And there is no net like delusion. What a powerful description of these root causes of how we get stuck. No fire like lust. When greed has you gripped, there's nothing like it. There's no grip like anger. When you are caught in hatred, judgment, blame, you know that grip. And no net like delusion. When you're confused, when you're, when you're deluded, when you're believing things that aren't true or not sure what to believe, that's, there's a certain kind of paralysis and feeling caught there. And so she realized that she wanted to get to a better place, the, the, the craving, the desire. She wanted to get away from the unpleasantness, the, the, the hatred, the judgment she had toward what she was feeling. And she felt completely caught in that web of confusion. We talk sometimes about this concept of the witness, your capacity for self-observation without judgment. And, and when you have access to the witness, you can notice how things change and you can let them change. But of course, we, we lose that sense of the witness all the time. We get attached to a state. We get aversive toward a state. And so, what happens is you get on this, you get on this wave. That's how I experience it. This metaphor of the wave. First, there's a clench. Something's wrong. Either something's wrong with me or something's wrong out there. And you can feel that clench. And that's when the wave begins to form. That's when the tension begins to build. And that tension, depending on how much you're clenching, is going to rise in intensity. And you can feel the wave beginning to form. And what happens is as the wave begins to form, there's tremendous unpleasantness. That's when you want to bail. That's when you went out, when you want out. Classically, 
what will happen is you're going to get off the wave by jumping into anger, judgment, blame, expressing all of that, or you're going to disassociate and go to your happy place into fantasy or planning, or you'll get off the wave by being overcome by worry, by anxiety, or you'll get off the wave by, by numbing out, or you'll get off the wave by feeling a paralysis of self-criticism or, or that, that unbelievable clench of doubt. But if you can stay on the wave, this is where mindfulness comes in. If you can stay on that wave, the wave will crest. And on the other side of the wave, there's a shift. Have you ever had that experience of a strong emotion building when you can stay with it and the emotion comes up, you feel it fully unfiltered on the other side of that wave will be either just a sense of physical release or relief. There'll be a sense of like something, some weather system came through and now they're clearer skies. Sometimes there's a cognitive insight. You'll realize what you're holding on to that now you're not holding on to. Sometimes you'll feel a shift in identification from feeling tightly identified to something to a much more spacious quality of presence. This is the power of riding the wave, as has been said, that, that an emotion, a pure emotion, is about 90 seconds, about a minute and a half. When we interfere with the rise of that wave of that pure emotion, we can prolong that. And I'm pretty sure I have prolonged some strong emotional waves about 60 years. <laughs> when you have this observing power of mind, you can begin to explore what it's like in the absence of greed, hatred, and delusion. And it points toward this quality of mindfulness. So the attitude in the mind becomes a very interesting angle, a very interesting approach to notice when the filter <clears throat> of wanting, aversion, and confusion are strong. Just recognizing the filter sometimes will either remove the filter or give you some insights as to the filter you're looking through. So, so recognizing what's there does not necessarily mean acceptance. <clears throat> you can see that you're judging, but what often happens is, at least for me, when I realize I'm judging myself, then I start judging myself for judging, if you've ever done that. So here's the question. How do you cultivate more mindfulness in your life? We know from brain science that the neurons that fire together wire together. So as you, as I often like to say, some people are anger waiting to happen. You know, some people are rejection waiting to happen. Some of us are sadness waiting to happen, depression waiting to happen. We have these, all these inborn inclinations through our conditioning. But with mindfulness, we can begin to recognize the filter through which we're perceiving, and we can begin to feel more space and more possibility. And so as I was exploring with this woman caught in worry and anxiety, as she began to notice the filters through which she was proceeding, or the filters through which she was perceiving, she recognized the desire to get out, the aversion toward being stuck, the confusion around all that was going on. And we continued the investigation somatically. We turned to look at where, what's holding on? What's tight? What's not flowing? What's congested? And she began to notice that where she felt the holding on was, was this clench in her belly. And she could feel it like this line running up through her heart and into her throat. She said, it's almost like, a, like I can't speak. With mindfulness, with non-judging awareness, sometimes you can stay with that difficulty. And she was able to recognize this clench, to know it was there. And the important thing now, to recognize that she could begin to allow it, that she could make room for it. Mindfulness is not just recognizing there's a quality of 
making room for it if you can, if it feels safe. And so as she just sat with these deep somatic feelings arising about all this clench of worry and anxiety, just making room for it. It's almost like, like when you're, when you're working with something really, really difficult and you can begin to be mindful and recognize it, you can inquire, can I be with it? Like you're sitting on a park bench together. And then she just sat with it because she began to notice that she had all lots of other content arising. And then she said, I just remembered my mom saying to me, you're too needy. You need to learn to do things on your own. And I remember how much that hurt. And so we took time to address that and she could feel it like a stabbing in her heart. And then she began to, began to recognize that in the hurt was this tremendous sense of anger and this tremendous sense of, I'll show you, I'm not going to need anything anymore. And she said, and now I take care of everyone. I don't have needs. I run the house. I take care of my parents. I take care of my kids. I provide income in my household. And I realize all this time I'm trying to prove her wrong, that I'm responsible for everything. I don't need help. I can do it myself. And this took us to the end of rain of nurturing what you find, nurturing what you discover. And I asked her if she could hold that with any sense of loving presence, any sense of tenderness or kindness. And as she did, she began to soften, she began to weep. And for five or six or seven minutes, she simply sat with her hand on her heart and just explored what it was like just to be with that, to really make room for that to sense not just the hurt, but how her whole life was designed around not feeling that hurt, that judgment, that criticism from her mother. That was my last interview with her. And I didn't have the opportunity to follow up or, or talk with her, but I certainly had a sense that something profound had been released. Can you sense the power of that wave, of riding the wave, staying on it with mindfulness? It's about moving from resistance to acceptance, to the sense of this, this is what's happening right now. It's really easy for me to talk about this. It's, it's pretty simple, be aware, <laughs> but it's not easy. And that's why, that's why we practice. That's why we cultivate this observing quality of mind. So in the little bit of time I have left, I'd like to share with you a couple kind of pragmatic things that you can explore in your practice. And one of them is a technique that for some they find tremendously helpful. For others, it's, it's, it can be a little bit irritating or a little bit challenging. And it's called, it's called noting, mental noting or labeling. And it's just as you're practicing, you're just using words to describe what you're aware of. It might be, you know, in, out, hearing, tightness, thinking, in, out. What this does is it can bring a, a, a focus, it can bring a, a clarity to what's actually happening moment by moment by moment. And it's, it's a way of sort of verifying that you're actually connecting to the moment. Are you, are you really connecting to the moment? And the practice here is to, to notice that as you're practicing even being aware of the noting, <laughs> this is what I've noticed, is that that the tone of your noting kind of reveals the quality of mind. So I'll think of, sometimes I'll be practicing like, oh, pff, thinking, pff, judging. 
you know, it's just the judging, the judging. It's it's kind of a, a a soft noting, a kind of a soft tone that can give you a, a sense of a sense of continuity. It's good to experiment with it. Some love it, some find it kind of irritating. But what I find is when I'm in a really big storm, something really strong is arising, then it's really really helpful because there's so much happening when there's a lot of energy flowing. Just like oh, tight belly. Um, slowing breath, rising heat, a pulsing anger, fear. Just that, that, that noting can be really, really helpful. And we'll practice a little bit before we close. Another is something that I mentioned earlier, which is just noticing the attitude in your mind. You can just from time to time inquire, what's the attitude now? And this sort of reveals the filter through which you're viewing where you can see if there's a wanting. You can see if there's an aversion going on, if there's some confusion going on. And this has been very, very helpful for me when I have a headache and I'm sort of like noting from time to time, like what's the attitude in my mind? I really want this to go away. Oh, the aversion, just seeing the aversion. Can I make room for the aversion is the next question. <laughs> and who am I without the aversion oh, can sometimes open up new possibilities. You know, when it comes to this practice of mindfulness, there's a classic phrase, which is used a lot, that, that what is happening is not that important. <laughs> what is important is how you are relating to it. Mindfulness points toward the possibility of, of, of viewing your experience moment by moment without the filter of greed, hatred, and delusion. Discomfort is not so much an issue in meditation as it is how you're relating to the discomfort. It's so, it's just so fundamental. It's so close in. What I find is these practices about mindfulness, I just need to hear it again and again because it has to do with cultivating that quality of pure wakefulness, of non-judging awareness. It's amazing. And just as when you focus on present moment, you'll be aware of how you're not. When you focus on non-judging, you notice how you judge. If you ever walk through a supermarket and find yourself glancing in people's cart and completely judging who they are and how they're eating, it, you can't, it's just there all the time. And being aware of it can be so, so powerful. It's a way of, it's a way of cutting through to come in contact with what's here. It's a way of truly finding freedom in a turbulent life. Let's take a few minutes just to practice together and we'll review some of these particular techniques. This will be just for a few minutes before we close. So if you like, you can close your eyes. And if you would take, take three slow, deep breaths. And sense, if you can, this quality of, of non-judging awareness, of awareness that is free from the filter of, of wanting, of aversion, of confusion. And for the next minute, you might explore this quality of, of, of noting. Can you describe your experience or what you're noticing in a word? And you don't have to do it really, really fast. But just to, to give a name to what you're noting, it might be in and out or thinking or hearing.
can you sense how this quality of noting can cultivate a sense of continuity, a sense of moment to moment noticing what is here? And you may find that this practice of noting is something you might like to incorporate more in your practice, or it might just be kind of a go-to tool that you might draw on from time to time, particularly if you're going through something really challenging to kind of break down the moment to moment awareness of what is here. Now you might again take three slow, deep breaths. And then sense, if you can, what is the attitude in your mind right now? Can you sense the potency of this question and noticing the subtlety of leaning forward or pulling back or a sense of confusion or a lack of clarity. This fundamental quality of mindfulness, sensing this quality of pure awareness, unfiltered through these roots of greed, hatred, and delusion. As so many of us are still in quarantine, I'd like to offer these words from, from Thich Nhat Hanh. It's entitled, How to Find True Solitude. Being alone means you are established firmly in the here and the now, and you become aware of what is happening in the present moment. You use your mindfulness to become aware of every feeling, every perception you have. You are aware of what is happening around you in your community, but you are always with yourself. You don't lose yourself. That's the Buddha's definition of the ideal practice of solitude, not to be caught in the past or carried away by the future, but always to be here, body and mind united, aware of what is happening in the present moment. That is real solitude. As you're ready, you can deepen your breath. As you're ready, you can open your eyes. I truly wish you well. I wish you great ease. May your cup feel full and overflowing so that you might respond to these challenging times in a way that feels aligned with your heart, feels aligned with your sense of purpose. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Many, many blessings in your practice and in your life. May all beings feel free. May all beings feel happy. May all beings feel safe. Thank you again.